Hi, welcome to Remember This with Denise Bowen. I am so thrilled to have with me music living legend Don McLean. He's a singer, songwriter, guitarist, and the way I see him, a wonderful poet and storyteller. You know him by his famous and timeless 1971 anthemic hit song, American Pie. That song went number one over 50 years ago and remained number one on the Billboard charts for eight weeks. It's been covered by Perry Como, Elvis Presley, and Madonna. To this day, it remains a classic of American folk rock music and was named a top five song of the 20th century by the Recording Industry of America. Don is also known for his mega hit songs like Vincent, Crying, Since I Don't Have You, Empty Chairs, and the song that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle chose for their wedding song, And I Love You So. Well, Don McLean is celebrating the 50th anniversary of American Pie with a world tour and a documentary, The Day the Music Died, The Making of Don McLean's American Pie. It comes out on Paramount Plus on July 19th. And he also has a children's book, American Pie, A Fable. It's, it just keeps getting better and better. Don keeps getting better and better. Everybody, please welcome Don McLean. Don, thank, thank you. you so thank you so much for joining me. I got to correct you about one thing. Como did not record American Pie. I think there'd be too much energy for him. Oh, uh, he recorded End I Love You So. He had a top 10 record and sold a million copies with it, though. Did he really? Yes, he did. Wow. That was, that was the last million seller he ever had. And uh, he was my mother's favorite singer. Now, speaking of your mother, what did your mother think of all of this? Of you? Was, she, was she supportive? Of you becoming my a musician? My mother was supportive. Um, she, she was supportive. Uh, my father died when I was 15. He was not supportive. But he was just worried about me, you know, falling into, uh, you know, the abyss of show business. Uh, to him, it was like going off and joining the circus or something. He didn't approve of any of that. He passed right. away when I was 15. But, you know, I'm a lot like right. him. You know, I'm pretty straight-laced in a lot of ways. But my mom was, uh, I remember, in the, in, I was a little boy in a house full of adults, so, you know, it was me against the world, kind of, and uh, one of the things that used to send them all over the top with laughter, would, I would be seven years old or whatever, and I'd say, you know, Mom, I'm going to be a famous singer someday, and I'm going to buy you a mink coat. And they would, well, of course, a mink coat was the apex of, of style in the 1950s and, and my father could no, could no more afford a mink coat than he could a Cadillac or a Bentley. So they would laugh like crazy. Well, there's a great picture of me with my mother in her mink coat on her way to Carnegie Hall. Oh, that's wonderful. Sing. So I always made good on my promises, uh, even when I was seven. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, see, at, the, at the age of seven, you knew you wanted to, to be in the music industry. Yeah. I knew I was, I, I, you know, it's crazy. I think everybody feels this. So I don't want to say this, but I always felt that I had a guiding hand in my life of some sort that I, Amen. I knew where I was supposed to be, what I was supposed to do, and nothing was going to stop me uh, because I knew what I had to do. Yes. And it was a wonderful gift that I was given. And I think it was because I spent a lot of time at home uh, ill with asthma and I created my own world and therefore it was a world that nobody else could understand but 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 me and I knew that I wanted to be in that world I, I tell young people sometimes I say you know you got to put yourself in your own movie you know you know you have your dreams well that's your movie put yourself in there you know and it really seems so scary you know when you don't follow the crowd and get a you know the kind of day job with benefits and right. all this other stuff but if you're creative and you really do have um thoughts about uh, things that are not like that you know whether you want to be an, a, a painter or a sculptor or a writer or an artist or whatever you know you, you mustn't you mustn't give up on that because you're going to be a lousy um uh, employee anyway you know most people who are uh, thinking along those lines are not employable I'm unemployable I could never be employed <laughs> I mean the only other thing you did was deliver papers right that's right 
That's what the children's book is about. Uh, yes. It's the fable about Donnie Boy who delivered the papers and delivers the paper to Buddy and Buddy writes him notes and then Buddy isn't there anymore and then he goes off into the world with his guitar. And that's the story of Don McLean. Yeah. I, I got a lump in my throat when I got to the part about the papers piling up, but Buddy's papers and that he was gone. Well, um, there's a guy named Sidney uh, Spencer Proffer and his wife, Judy Proffer, and they have been a real gift to me. Um, Spencer knows everybody. He's one of those Zelig type people. He's everywhere, does everything. And the minute he heard about this 50th anniversary idea, he came up with a children's book, a documentary movie, and a Broadway show. And the children's book and the documentary movie are done. And on July 19th, you'll be able to see the movie on Paramount+. Plus. The book is out now on Amazon. You can go there and get it. And the Broadway show will happen because oh, he does what he says he's going to do. That, that will be amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's going to take a while because Broadway has to get cranked up again. And we've got a lot of work. But it'll be a year or two, probably two years from now, you'll be hearing about it. This song came out in 1971. I was seven years old. And I remember playing the album, not just the song. I was, I, you know, a lot like you, I was a loner. I spent my time just playing albums that were in the house. Yes, of course. And so every song and, and every song is different. But every song is just so amazing. Vincent, people called me, please tell Don McLean how much I love Vincent. Please thank him for that song. You Do you hear that a lot? You don't realize I have had, I've had a couple of rough patches in my life, but nothing serious, really. A couple of divorces. But what I've really had was the most fabulous life. I mean, I have, think about this. I've had money flowing in, um, love coming to me from everywhere in the world, standing ovations everywhere I go and do everything. Who lives a life like that? You know, who in the world has something like that? And I tell myself like that, you know, you are such a lucky bastard, you know, and uh, don't forget it. You know, and, and I'm really much more, con I honestly, sincerely am, um, really not that interested in Don McLean anymore. I've had everything. I'm really much more interested in in other people and what they're doing. And and this homeless situation really bothers me a lot. Um, I really see that as something that's going to explode in the next year or two. It's already bad, but yeah, how can we not worse. have a, you know, I love my homes. You know, I have a, I have a few homes and and I'm thinking, what's it like not to have a roof over your head? And I've seen some very, very sad things. Uh, I ramble around and I see stuff. I don't, I don't work in an office. You know, I travel. And I see a, a broken down young man, maybe 40 years old, holding the hand mm -hmm. of a little boy with a dog walking along. Aww. And they don't have a thing. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, I'm looking at it from the back. And I'm looking, what's he going to do with that little boy tonight? What's going to happen? You know, mm -hmm. it just it's terrible. And um, and it's just going to get worse. I wrote a whole album actually called Homeless Brother um, with a guy named Joel Dorn. Uh, had a song called Wonderful Baby, which came off that record. And um, he was the best producer I ever. Well, one of the greatest producers ever. And certainly the best friend, one of the best friends I ever had in this business. He was he's passed away now, but. Um, anyway, I started mention that. Yeah, and you have a foundation, right? The Don yeah, McLean I do. Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's the Don McLean Foundation. Everything I have is going to go in it, and uh, it's going to it's going to going to try to alleviate suffering. That's going to be the goal. That's wonderful. You're very humble. I love that about you. You're very humble. I got you have a good heart. <laughs> <laughs> So my daughter's a big fan. She learned she learned American Pie on first on her ukulele. Oh yeah, that's how I that's how I started playing on the ukulele. Yeah. When she said to me I want to buy a ukulele, like why? Like who plays a ukulele? But Oh god, they're so handy. Oh that's yeah. Your, that's where that's your gateway drug. 
And that's exactly what it was for her. (laughs) It started with that and then then guitar. And she's also an artist. But so in honor of the the 50th anniversary of American Pie, in honor of you, Don McLean, she (laughs) Ah, (laughs) she painted this on. I love it. Isn't that great? Trying to get like. I hope more people will get that tattooed on their thumb. Wouldn't that be? Oh, it must hurt like hell to have that happen. Oh Oh my gosh. (laughs) Can you imagine how painful that would be? I've had five children, but I'd be afraid to get a tattoo. (laughs) too painful <laughs> that's funny but i always i always uh, wondered how did how did the idea come about for the album cover well i was with a wonderful man named alan livingston he had a company called meteorites records he was the man who made capital records into the the amazing major label that it is today and he he retired and in 1969 formed meteorites records and um he put out Tapestry, and he was going to have the American Pie album, but the last minute, they lost their financing, and so United Artists bought the record label. But anyway, he did everything first class, and he sent me over to a guy named George Whiteman, who's in his 80s now. He lives down in Mexico. He was. This is a guy, I don't know if you know anything about uh, nude photography, but there was a wonderful photographer in the 50s called Andre Dudain, and he would take these glorious pictures of nude models in sand dunes. And he took pictures. He was real good friends with Marilyn, you know, and took pictures of her. Handsome man with a shock of wavy hair. That's what this guy, George Whiteman, was like. Big, he had a big Rolls Royce parked in front. Uh, I go over there. I, I, don't know, I took a cab or something. I forget how I got there with my guitar on my back. He comes in. He's he All of a sudden, this gorgeous women oh georgie you know putting his arms around i'm watching this whole thing i'm thinking this is only in hollywood this could happen that's to right me. so he says i'm going to paint your thumb i said okay let's do it so he did it and then you know i he put the guitar down and i'm looking over the guitar and that's what you can see the the pins on the guitar top there and that's how he did those the sessions it's wonderful well i've been looking at that thumb <laughs> For over 50 years. That's a famous record cover. It really is. And and you signed this one. Good. This one, this one is signed by you. Yep. Good. You came to St. George Theater here on Staten Island in 2017. Yes. And it was the first time I ever saw you in concert. You put it on an, an amazing show. You really do. You really engage everyone. And you had that whole place singing every single line to American Pie. And you probably won't remember this, but there was one woman in the front, right in front of you, and she was dancing. And I remember ah. thinking, I never I never knew you could dance to it, but I guess you can. It's it's something different for everyone. But um, it's how, how do you feel when you're doing, now you're on tour. How do you, do you know feel when you get that reaction? Do you know there's a dance version of this song now? It just Is came there? out. Yeah, you, can, you Google me and you'll see it. There's a little red square. Yeah, there's a dance version for working out. It's it's it's, it's the original record. They've they've hyped the hell out of it. It's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Well, like my a disco beat. Loves it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I have yeah. to. So have to no, check it out. I, I I don't. You know, like I said before, uh, who has a life like this? I'm aware of that. I just want to do the best I can for people, and um, I want to make it an interesting experience to come and see me. Something that you'll remember well through the years. Um, and I want to say different things and do different things and sing different songs. But always I want to sing the songs they know that they want to hear. I always do Crying and Vincent and Castles and American Pie and yes. uh, Crossroads and these songs, you know, that people like. So because I know they, they spend a lot of money and they wait a long time and they get really excited about it. And I don't want to disappoint them. Um, oh no, you, you, you definitely don't disappoint because you know what people that come to see you, they're not just fans of American pie. No, they're fans right. of all your songs. You know? Yeah, there really are. And, uh, and I'm, I'm aware of the money is tight, you know, and inflation and all that now. And, um, and, oh, I remember when I would go see, uh, I used to go once in a while, I would see a great act like Frank Sinatra at Carnegie hall or something. And I buy the ticket. Mm-hmm six months in advance and i'd be thinking it was in high school or something oh man this is going to be something i want to hear these arrangements i want to see the man sing you know and it, it was just a fabulous thing 
you know, to have something that you wanted to see, um, you know, whatever it was, Ella Fitzgerald or the Rolling Stones, I saw them and I saw everything. I saw, I was at Shea Stadium when the Beatles played there. I was at Bank. Where are you? That con oh yeah, I was everywhere. I was always everywhere. I saw everything. Did you meet any of the Beatles? Never met the Beatles. No, I didn't. I love the Beatles. The Beatles were very important to me as a songwriter because they never repeated themselves. They always wrote new things, and they, and they had a wonderful sense of beautiful melodies, a long and winding road. Of yes. So much. It's so gorgeous, you know. And really, music and movies have degenerated into nothing but bombast and sensory assault and especially in movies, guns and blowing stuff up. I yeah. mean, I like, I like yeah. guns. I like blowing things up as much as the next guy. But you don't have the lyric quality. Look at the old movies, the titles of, you know, Since You Went Away, you know, these beautiful titles. Um, yes. You know, the Best Years of Our Lives. Oh, yes. Classic. Oh, so many other, but the titles said so much. And they were written by great writers, you know, that, that went out and worked for the studios, you know, and, 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 and the, the studio heads wanted literate scripts. They don't want that now. You know, they want another, you know, one of these guys like, yeah. I mean, I, I think Sylvester Carbon Stallone copies. is a very brilliant guy in, in some ways, but they want, you know, those kind of movies, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or whatever. Yeah. And uh, enough already. Yeah. Yeah, my well, my daughter, my daughter is 38 now. When she was 17, she she slept outside Barnes and Noble in Manhattan waiting to meet Paul McCartney. Oh. <laughs> and, and I remember they interviewed her, uh, you know, one of the news networks and said, you're 17 years old. Well, how, how are you a Beatles fan? And she said, because you can't compare the Beatles music to the music today. You know, the, no, you, can't. you have carbon, carbon cutouts. You have boy bands, you know, it's not. It's, We'll never get that music again. I don't know what they're thinking when they write some of this stuff. I hear it. I can't remember it, first of all. I don't know how their minds are wired to remember this stuff, because I can't remember it. It's, it is forgettable. That is the nature of this stuff. You it know, is. There's music that's memorable, and then there's music that's forgettable. Well, this is very forgettable. And one of the things that has been shown is that the, this is why the music business and the publishers are buying these catalogs of uh, Dylan and uh, whatever. I mean, Paul McCartney doesn't have his catalog yes. to sell. Biggest blunder in history. Yes, The yes. Rolling Stones don't have their catalog to sell. Biggest blunder in history. Alan B. Klein took these guys to the cleaners. It can happen to anybody in this business, even the biggest and smartest with all the great talent around them, the lawyers, whatever. Yeah. So this is a rough business. you got to watch out. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, they're buying these catalogs because they know that 40 percent of all the money that comes in on publishing still comes in from songs from like 1975 and before. That's right. That's where the money is, mm -hmm. because that's where the real music is. We've gotten away from it. And the, and, and, and the, and the economics of it is the proof of that. Yeah. That people, they hear it five times. They don't want to hear it again. Exactly. And there's such a hunger for classic music. And even when they came out with the record players for this generation, I mean, that was such a novelty for them to have a record player and to play old records on them. Oh, I think, um, I, I think the thing to think about is that if you, I think what they're hearing perhaps is that the record is the last word and then when you got to CDs, they would sometimes remaster a song. Now, I don't know if people know what mastering is, but let me explain what it is. If you mix a song, you take every single element of that song and you put a sound on that song, every one of those elements, and then you put it all together. That's mixing. Once you get it mixed, you get it down to a two-track master. And that's what you, then you master that. Now, what that is, is just like if you're listening to something, let's say you're and you want to boost the bass or the mid range or whatever, you have little controls. You can't change the relationship of all the instruments to one another because that's locked in now because you mixed it that way. But you can change what, you, what frequencies you bring out. 
you want to emphasize a little bass, a little mid-range, a little high-end, whatever. That's mastering. And then once they lock that in, that's the album. They put that album out. That's the last word that George Martin has on A Rubber Soul. But some kid is going to take that and fool around with it. And when he puts it on a, on a, on a CD, it's not going to sound like the record. And it's amazing how different, how mastering can change that uh, a ton. Paul, um, I mean, Mick Jagger has been known to care more about mastering almost than mixing. It's so important. And yeah. these kids fool with these original records and they change them. Uh, and they don't sound the same. They don't no, hang they don't. right. So that's what you're hearing. So if you can really get uh, an original CD uh, that, you know, or that was not screwed around with, that, then that's going to sound like the record. But it's, I don't know. It's kind of hopeless. You know, you're you're fighting against entropy. You're fighting against, uh, you know, the nature of time and decay and everything. Yeah. It's... Do you see things turning around, like ever going back? No, we never go back. Goes. That's the thing we have to remember. We can pretend to go back. We can reach back. We can touch Elvis Presley uh, on the uh, Dorsey show, but we can't ever go back. The problem with us is we think we can go back. We live in the past. I think this is what American Pie relates. I think it's one of the reasons why the song resonates more than ever, because we are living in the past just like the song is living in the past. It's, it's yearning. It's, there's a lot of yearning that goes on, and there's a lot of desperation in life. You have to accept the future, uh, and, and, and the music says what the culture is, and the culture is loud, the culture is brainless, the culture is bombastic, the culture is pretty mean and misogynist, I might say, I don't know. A lot of this rap stuff is not very nice as far as women are concerned. And it's crude and it's porno. It's it's really low. And so that's that's where we are. You know, that's what it says about us. You know, we're not highfalutin. We don't want to write scripts like, you know, the best days of our lives or whatever. The script is gone with the wind or something. Yeah, that's that's what it tells you. It's telling you something. It's telling you something. Yeah. I mean, that's why I started this show. This this show, is, it's called Remember This because it's nostalgic. It's retro pop culture because people like to remember what, you know, the music they listen to, the movies they watch, the TV shows, the food they ate, the clothes they wore. You know, people are very nostalgic because it was a simpler time. It was a happier time. Well, I don't think that it's I don't believe in nostalgia I think you should love what you love and not be apologetic about it and I don't think that uh, anybody who is uncomfortable with the way things are should participate you know do something else you Absolutely. Know, be your own person problem is that you've got all these peer groups and people that try to push you and comment having friends <laughs> is the worst way to be an artist if you're going to be an artist, you ain't going to have no friends because you're going to say something that's going to offend somebody. If you don't, you're not an artist. That's right. So you can yeah. forget about friends. And to some degree, you can forget about family because you're going to offend them. And, you know, you have to it's it's truth. You know, it really is. If you're too if you're too democratic and diplomatic, you're not going to be an artist. You have to go your own way and you have to say what you believe. And if you say what you believe, you're going to piss somebody off. Yeah. <laughs> cancel culture is crazy, right? Comedians, yeah. they, they have to be careful what they're saying now because well, everybody's that, getting offended. But that's why that slap that that idiot, uh, Will Smith, <laughs> threw his own yes. career away in two seconds flat. What was that? <laughs> ruined, ruined the movie that was uh, the documentary. I mean, ruined the story about the, um, the the tennis players and their father ruined that whole night for them. Yes. What a selfish, stupid thing to do. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, and this is what I, this is, nobody has a sense of humor. No. Nobody, has, if you went, and I gotta go in a minute, but nobody, okay. I gotta tell you something. You look uh, at the Hollywood Palace, you can find it on YouTube. You'll see Sinatra as the host, right? 
he just got married to Mia Farrow, which you know caused a, a huge uproar. I mean, she was looked like his granddaughter or something, and he got mocked and derided for this. You know, he on the show is Jack E. Leonard. They used to call him Fat Jack Leonard. He was a brilliant comedian. He mocks Sinatra about his wife. He mocks him about his son getting kidnapped. He mocks him about everything. And Sinatra's, oh, laughing, you know, ha, 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 you know. Because that's when you're a big star. Yes. You got to have, you know, you got to say that comes with the territory. So here's this guy who says something about his wife's hair, which she'd been talking about. And he goes up and slaps him in the mouth. Come on, and, man. And, I mean, and, and he laughed about it at first, you know. And then, you know, no, the whole thing is... he, those people, that's it's just it's it, comedy. No one has a sense of humor. You can't even go on a college campus. Nobody. They don't have singers. They don't have comedians on college campuses because those people, the kids on those campuses are the least intellectual people going. I would suggest a community college or homeschooling rather than subject my children to the school system now. And I am not kidding. And I would also say one more little thing, since I'm on a rant here, I think, that, I think that every kid in this country should do two years of community service after they get out of school. If they don't, they're out of high school, they got to do two years. Out of college, they got to do two years. What does that mean? You got to, I think, it would help them care about the country more. Like they do in Israel, you got to go in the army, whatever, and you come back with a sense of your country. I really think we need that. That's right. Now. I agree. I, I would never have said that before. Anyway, I have to go. I love talking to you. Thank you. For okay. Listening. All right. Thank you so much for being in the documentary. I mean, just one, guys, make sure you check out the documentary on no, July 19th. get away from this one. Let me tell you. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Quick, quick question. I'm going to let you go. I always wanted to know this, the, the title is American Pie, but you sing Miss American Pie. Is that a play on like Miss America or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but I didn't mention that in the movie, so you found something I didn't say. <laughs> there you go. Don McLean, it was a complete honor and pleasure Thank to you. speak with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And congratulations on 50 years of American Thank Pie. Thank you. A nice Children's talking book, to you. And the documentary. God bless you. Thank you very much. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Bye.